What is good everybody and welcome back to another My Damn Toys video. Today I have my very first Monday Night Raw review for you guys. And I hate to say it, I thought this was going to be a lit first episode of this series. But it turns out that Raw 25 was just not very good. And my enthusiasm is probably going to go away really, really fast. Because this show was complete awfulness. Besides one little skit with Chris Jericho and Elias Sampson... This show was just, I don't know where they were going with it. I knew that it was going to be a nostalgia fest, but my God, this show fell flat on its face. And I know a ton of people were disappointed, but let's go ahead and get into it. Alright guys, so the show started off with the McMahon kids coming to the ring. Shane and Stephanie, they come out, they talk about Raw 25, yada yada yada, all that business. And then they introduce their father, the one and only chairman of the WWE, Vincent Kennedy McMahon, comes out to the ring. And you know, they're all talking and good jazz and they're having fun and they're whatever. And uh, I'm not going to lie, this, this was a great first segment. I thought that Vince was on fire. Um, they presented him with a plaque and it was like 25th anniversary or Raw, whatever. And they talked about, they, uh, you know, they had to start a GoFundMe to even get the plaque. And the people of Brooklyn presented him with this plaque. And then Vince rips into the plaque. You know, he's talking about that plaque is uh, the stuff that Brooklyn has on its teeth. And the people of Brooklyn are poor. And that's probably why he ended up with this crappy plaque or whatever. And he's ripping into it. He's making some good cheap heat, you know, doing all kinds of jazz. And then, of course, the freaking glass breaks and out comes Stone Cold Steve Austin. And saves this uh, little skit going on. And Stone Cold just cleans house. I don't even remember what happened to Stephanie. But Stone Cold comes out and he just stuns Shane twice. Gives Vince a stunner. You know, he doesn't even talk on the mic, which I thought was pretty weird. But um, I wanted to hear him, you know, cut a promo or at least interact with the McMahons. But he did not. He just stunned everyone and left. You know, had the Steve Weisers out just going ham. It was a great opener to the show. I was really excited after this. You know, good nostalgia pop. And, you know, when the GOAT comes to the ring, everyone loves it. It was a huge pop and just a great way to start out this show. It would quickly fall downhill from there. Then, of course, it would not be Monday Night Raw without a freaking multi-women tag team match. I am absolutely sick of seeing these matches. I feel like every single week on both brands, we have just been just freaking multi-women tag matches have been shoved down our throats. So, of course, we have to have Asuka, Sasha, Bayley, and freaking I don't even remember who else, versus Nia Jax, Absolution, and Alicia Fox. Of course, the face team wins. Just your typical eight whatever women tag team match. Asuka, um, well, no, Sasha Banks ends up locking in the bank statement on Alicia Fox. Then, after the match, Team Face wins. Then Asuka cleans house, which is the best part about this, uh, this little interaction. After the match, everybody's celebrating, and then Asuka just destroys everyone, which I enjoyed. That's exactly how the Women's Royal Rumble should be, you know. Uh, Asuka coming out number one and just cleaning house and winning the Rumble with ease. That is how the first ever Women's Royal Rumble should go. And um, I guess Asuka just be champion forever, but that's pretty much what happened with this. Next up, it cuts to the GM Kurt Angle's office where he is just chilling, talking to a referee, and then in come a bunch of legends. Jonathan Coachman, freaking uh, Brother Love comes in there, Teddy Long coming in there, and then it's all interrupted by the man, Boogeyman, gets in there. Boogeyman interrupts all of them. You know, they're having a nice time. Um, he gives Jonathan Coachman some worms, and that was a pretty cool moment, I guess. Um, I always liked Boogeyman just because he was always funny. You know, I liked his character. I love his entrance music for some reason, but I thought this moment was pretty cool just to have Boogeyman in there. Um, I would love to see him in the Rumble. Just F it. Just waste a spot on the Boogeyman. I'm all for it. We come back up and we head to the Manhattan Center where I know a ton of people were pissed off. You know, they did not get very much action tonight and I'm sure um, there will be some riots in the city tonight, man, because they did not give them anything where they had to watch half the show on a Jumbotron and I know that was very upsetting. Of course, they got to see DX, you know, and The Undertaker and then a crappy match. But um, yeah, I hope some more things happened over there. If not, but... Uh, getting into this right here, Undertaker does return, comes to the ring not wearing his hat, his gloves, or his coat. I did notice that. He cuts a promo talking about 25 years of digging holes and taking legends off of their pedestals. Named a whole bunch of legends that he has taken out. 
Um, then he says, that he tells all the people that he's conquered to rest in peace. Um, I believe that's what he said. It was very weird. I was very confused by that. You know, there were a lot of rumors going around that John Cena's match for WrestleMania was going to be, the, the feud was going to start at this Raw, and I didn't see a John Brown thing except for some interactions, which we'll cover in just a second. But this was just very confusing to me. I did not understand what The Undertaker was doing. I didn't know. I think he was there simply for nostalgia and just making sure the people in the Manhattan Center did not riot. But uh, hopefully I'm wrong. Maybe they'll go forward with something. But I honestly am all good with The, uh, the Undertaker staying retired. We come back up and APA is playing poker with Heath Slater and Rhino, you know, keying in some funny jokes and jazz like that. Then up walks the million dollar man, Ted DiBiase, lays his signature laugh on him. It was pretty funny. Plops some money down on the table. I just thought this was a pretty funny moment just because Ted DiBiase is always killing it. Come back up and they are on the stage going through the greatest general managers in Raw history. They name off the late great William Regal. They go through John Laurinaitis, and then they even name the MDT Live General Manager himself, Eric Bischoff. And at that time, they go ahead and name the current General Manager of SmackDown Live. They name off Daniel Bryan, who has in just recently became one of the favorites to win the freaking Royal Rumble, which is absolutely crazy. And then, of course, in comes the freaking A-lister, The Miz coming out to the ring for his match against Roman Reigns. So interrupts The Miz. The Miz comes out. And then, of course, on his way to the ring after that, we have the big dog Roman Reigns coming out. And this match was solid. Um, I thought it was a pretty good match. Um, a typical Raw match. I like the ending. Uh, I could have sworn to Jesus I thought that Roman Reigns was going to kick out of that second skull-crushing finale and hit his face on the turnbuckle. I thought for sure that he was going to win, but he did not. So now, ladies and gentlemen, the big dog is no longer Intercontinental Champion, and the crown now belongs to The Miz. So The Miz is now an eight-time Intercontinental Champion, and this worries me because this could mean that Ro Roman Reigns is going to win the Royal Rumble. I hope not, but it could most certainly turn out that way. But um, I thought this was a decent match. It was probably the best night or the best match of the night, I believe. I'm um, looking over my notes here, but um, yeah. We come back up and Jeff Hardy and MVP have joined APA and company at the table to play some poker. Just cutting up, just another skit to, uh, you know, for time filler. Come back and it is Christian and the Peep Show. His guests tonight are Seth Rollins and Jason Jordan, the Raw Tag Team Champions. Jason just getting booed out of the freaking building, man. I swear to Jesus, he was just getting destroyed out there. But um, he interrupted Seth, you know, and was trying to brag about his dad and how he, you know, helped Raw or something like that. Um, of course, in come Cesaro and Sheamus. The bar do interrupt them. So here comes Cesaro. Here comes Sheamus. They cut a little promo in there. And then, of course, you know it had to happen. Um, the bar gets into the ring. Jason Jordan, I think, tried to attack either Cesaro or Sheamus. They get into a little scuffle. Seth tries to knee Sheamus or Cesaro in the face, but he accidentally just takes out Jason Jordan. So he takes him out, I guess, just building towards a, uh, you know, a breakup or heel, whatever the heck they're planning. I really do not care. I cannot stand Jason Jordan as a character. Very boring. Great in-ring wrestler. Just his character development and his acting skills are just awful. And I am just ready for something else to happen with him. Get rid of this stupid titles off of Jason Jordan, just please. Up next, we had a promo, or not a promo. Up next, we had a freaking interview with Alexa Bliss. Up walks the SmackDown Live Women's Champion Charlotte Flair. Talks about, I don't even know, she cut some useless, worthless promo that literally made no sense. Um, it was pretty much a, just a nostalgia act. Up walks her father. And they both woo at the same time. Just made no sense. And Ric Flair looked he, like he was about to pass out right there, man. Uh, he just did not look good at all. We cut back and Natalia, Titus, and Apollo have joined APA. I believe Dana Brooke was also thrown in there. And then we are interrupted by Bray Wyatt's entrance. And we are thrown to the Manhattan Center for a matchup between him and Matt Hardy. So now we're live at the Manhattan Center. Bray Wyatt taking on Woke and Matt Hardy. And this match was just not good at all. I feel like every time I looked up, we were on a commercial break. It was just not good. 
Um, I believe this is the first time they've had a match. I could be wrong, but if this was the first time, this was just dreadful. And I don't know where you go from here. You freaking, I feel like they have just devalued the crap out of freaking Woken Matt Hardy. You make him out to be this, you know, uh, specimen. You make him out to be this great big thing, and you freaking make him lose to Bray Wyatt. And Bray Wyatt just has not been on a good tear as of late either. This has been just, just atrocious. I did not understand why Matt Hardy had to lose here. Um, I just did not understand that. And um, the match ended so abruptly. It was like commercial, commercial, little spot, commercial. Uh, Bray Wyatt wins, and it was just not good to me. Then we move on to the best women in Raw's 25 years. They announced the Bella Twins. They announced Maurice. Kelly Kelly, Lillian Garcia, Jacqueline, Tori Wilson, Michelle McCool, Terry Runnels, Maria Kanellis, and Trish Stratus. And I thought it was really weird. I don't know if Lita couldn't make it or what, but um, it was just weird. I mean, they left off Stacey Keebler, Lita, among others they could have named. And I thought it was weird they even named Maurice. I mean, don't get me wrong, I like Maurice, but Maurice over Stacey Keebler and Lita and whatever. I mean, I know she, they didn't even name Beth Phoenix. I don't know. It was just weird. Um, I felt like they could have named a lot more. I don't know if it was just those people couldn't make it and they just wanted to name the people that made it. I'm sure that was probably the case. But um, anyways, I thought that was a little weird. Moving on to my favorite part of the entire night, hands down. Besides the Stone Cold Steve Austin star, guys, this was just hands down the best part of the show for me. Um, Elias is walking down the hall and in comes Chris Jericho with his alpha shirt on looking like a freaking boss. And he cuts this hilarious... Uh, altercation with Elias ends up putting him on the list with his stupid scarves going on there as well and it just proved he proved time and time again why is he why he is one of the greatest of all time one of my favorites hands down of all time Chris Jericho just always impresses me and he's just always hilarious and um, I feel like he's literally me he has my exact personality and it's just so amazing to see um, he is just so funny and this this part right here was just a beautiful segment and it totally made the night for me this is literally the only thing that didn't make this whole Raw episode a complete bust. Up next, we have Elias in the ring. You know, talking trash to the crowd is pretty solid. Um, I think, like, as the weeks go on, I think he's getting better and better. I am starting to enjoy Elias. I used to absolutely hate his guts. But out comes the greatest of all time himself, John Cena, making himself to the ring. And I thought for sure this man was about to destroy Elias. I thought for sure he was going to AA him, and that would be all you know, hit the trumpets, but that is not what happened. He five knuckles, shuffles him. Um, Elias does get a low blow on John Cena, then hits him with a guitar, and then hits him with his finisher, and John Cena just lays waste in the middle of the ring. I thought this was pretty weird. Um, no Undertaker inter, like, in, you know, inter involved in this, and there was just nothing built out of it. I don't know where we go from here. Is Elias and Cena going to feud? I don't, I don't know. This was just a waste of time, and I think this was simply put in there to, um, I guess, protect Elias from burial, and then, uh, I guess, just have John Cena on the show just for shits and giggles. Come back now, and the New Day has now joined APA at their poker table. I believe the Usos were there, too. Could not fit them in the frame, but F it, this thing didn't matter anyways. Up next, we just had a quick time filler right here with Mark Henry talking to the Godfather for some weird reason. They literally talked for like 15 seconds, and then we were on to this match between Slater and Rhino taking on Titus Worldwide. So we're having this match between Slater and Rhino and Titus Worldwide for no freaking reason at all. It ends in disqualification, and then you already know, out come the Dudley boys, and um, we had uh, Bubba Ray and Devon just come out for no apparent reason, and you knew what was going to happen. Freaking Devon, get the tables. He Slater. I don't know why, but Rhino just sat there, and I guess it goes back to ECW or something, because he just sat there and let his tag team partner, he even helped. Devon lift up the ring apron and Heath Slater goes straight through the table and that was pretty much it for this match. Just another nostalgia pop for the crowd. We cut to an interview for AJ Styles and again this is literally nothing. They talk about the Royal Rumble and he calls Sammy and Kevin Owens Cammy again which I think is really cringy and just really really weird. But um, Mean Gene Okerlund comes up. He says some weird stuff. Again, just another nostalgia act. And we're on to the Manhattan Center again. So over at the freaking Manhattan Center, we're having the DX reunion. You know, they're cutting promos 
all talking. They introduce each other. Triple H and Michaels out first. They introduce the New Age Outlaws, Road Dog, and Billy Gunn. They introduce X-Pac, and then he introduces Scott Hall. And it was funny because in the middle of Scott Hall's entrance, he gets cut off, and we cut straight to commercial. Come back, Scott Hall in the ring, talking yada, yada, yada. And out comes the man himself, Finn Balor, and he is not alone. He is with his goons, the club. We got Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson with uh, him. And they're looking good. You know, I did not know what was about to happen. Everyone's too sweeting in the ring. And then they get interrupted. A lot of people saw this coming. You know, I think the Revival are in trouble with Vince. So out come the Revival. And when they come out, they, uh, they had a short little match in which they got buried by the club. They were beaten just very, very easily. So the Revival get buried. And then they get proceeded to get all of the finishers from everybody in the ring. They just kicked their asses. And this is just a huge mistake, I think. They have taken the Revival, who, you know, were very high, uh, highly rated, and they were looking great, and then they have just been used terrible, just a terrible year for them, you know, injuries and getting in trouble and now being buried at Raw 25. Just not a good um, act for the Revival tonight, and I think it's just so awful. Then to end the show, guys, we had Kurt Angle and, like, half the roster come out for absolutely no reason. If you notice, during the whole charade, Nobody on the roster literally did anything, and Kane got absolutely buried. So out comes first is, I think Braun Strowman came out first, if I'm not mistaken. It, it may have been Kane. Does it, does it even matter? No, not really. Anyways, Braun Strowman comes to the ring, and um, Kane comes to the ring, and um, then, of course, Paul Heyman comes out, and the man himself... Brock Lesnar comes to the ring, and then all hell just exploded. It was pretty cool. Um, it got me a little hyped for the match on Sunday, but I know that Brock's going to win. But um, if it's as high, uh, hard-hitting as um, this was at the end of this show, then I'm looking forward to it. I mean, we had freaking just everything, man. Uh, just hard hits. Freaking Brock Lesnar clotheslined the dog crap out of Braun Strowman on the outside coming down the ramp. Uh, F5 to Kane, and um, I thought it was a really cool ending. Uh, besides the entire shit show, um, I thought that um, the ending was pretty good. The beginning was good, the ending was good, and then Chris Jericho. That's literally all this thing was, and I still don't think it was cool to have the whole roster come out because they didn't even do anything. They didn't separate anybody. It was literally just Braun, just hard-hitting stuff. Braun puts Brock through the announce table, and, you know, Braun's chilling on the uh, turnbuckle to end the show. And uh, Raw 25 was very anticlimactic. Again, besides the Chris Jericho thing, very disappointed. Um, literally three high points, if any. And what culture is probably going to down the crap out of this thing. But we'll see. But um, that was it for Raw 25. Again, no feud started, really. Uh, not really anything going into the Royal Rumble. Um, I'm confused, and Royal, Re Royal Rumble predictions coming soon. Let me know down below if you guys would like to see me review SmackDown Live tomorrow night. Also, would you like to continue to see this Monday Night Raw review series? Let me know. Leave a like, comment down below what you thought of Raw 25, and if you want to see this series continue, subscribe for more epic WWE and WWE figure-related videos, and I will see you guys in the next video. Thank you.